and serve him. I remember growing up, I would uh, couldn't spell words. I remember the big debate I got into with my children over the refrigerator. Remember that? I lost. <laughs> yeah. And so my grandmother would say, I was like, well, how do you, Nanny, how do you spell this word that she would say every time? Look it up. <laughs> it ranks up there with this hurts you more than it hurts me. You know? <laughs> so, if you're having trouble with concern, I would say look it up. Just ask your neighbor and they'll get you logged in. I do regret I washed my Redskin socks to wear them because they play the Patriots. <laughs> a tough story. And I, I left. I forgot to put them on. You ever just kick yourself? Sunday Saints. Here are these words. Now, don't, don't worry about all the points like point one, point twenty, point. Just remember these words. Sunday Saints understand the importance of daily worship. Sunday saints understand the importance of daily worship. Maybe a playoff New Orleans Saints because it's football Sunday, but the Lord can use any thought, amen, so he understands. Uh, several years ago, our youth group came to you all and asked about worship, and you gave definitions to what worship is. And for those that were part of that, we found that not every definition was the same. Everybody had a different thought of what worship was. So I actually got to study it and it said that one out of five people will have a different definition. You couldn't find five people and come up with the same definition two times. So there's a thought going through my head that if we're coming to worship and we have X amount of thoughts of what worship is, how are we really worshiping? So I know it's an individual experience because Sunday Saints know that. And Sunday Saints are not just people who attend church on Sunday. They're worshiping every day, which is important. It's important in your life. It's important in your family. We've been talking about the family, the husbands, dads. Uh, we're talking about our society. So you guys defined it. Uh, I want to go back. We've looked at Psalm 150 multiple times, but I, I really want to see it again because... We use the word worship uh, consistently and in some ways loosely. We sing songs about worship. And, um, you notice the song we just sang, uh, Open the Eyes of What? My Heart. My heart. So that it's pure and um, I'm before the Lord and I'm able to worship Him. Uh, we'll sing in the back for our breakfast, by the way, if you... If you 9.30 Sunday mornings, we do have some, some breakfast. And Cindy made homemade biscuit and gravy uh, at the house. Was it last weekend? Connor would not touch it. <laughs> uh, now let me make it clear. It was absolutely delicious. He said he compared it to what? Church group. What church group? <laughs> so... Which he now calls the glory of God gravy. The glory of God gravy is what he calls it. <laughs> the glory of God gravy. Well, let the children be children. All right, Psalm 150. And um, praise and worship is important. So every time you hear or see praise, uh, I want you to write or understand the word is hallelujah. Okay, so Psalm 150, last of the book of Psalms, but it's an individual, it's Psalm 150. And so we're going to go through the who, what, when, where's, and why's, and we'll see about worship, because it's a term I'm afraid we use loosely, and it's a term I'm afraid that we come to an organized event to receive some type of motivation to worship the Lord. And I believe, and I'm a firm believer, that God's Word will motivate us. Uh, it'll also discourage us. Uh oh It'll discourage you from doing things that you shouldn't be doing. So it's an encouragement, it's a discouragement that God's Word answers all life's questions. And I've always heard that, but until you dig into it, you don't really understand, but it's there. 
So anytime you see the word praise, you substitute it for hallelujah. So notice Psalm 150, so that we're all on board with the same type of worship as we move forward. Notice what he said. So we've got to define, if we're going to worship something, by the way, worship, you would say, well, I would never worship anyone or anything outside of God. Worship, in its purest form, by the original definition, was worth, W-O-R-T-H, we've said that before. Uh, so it's what you place value in. How much value do you place into something, someone, or an item? It could be a vehicle. It could be a phone. It could be a relationship. You've placed value into this or this person, and you've elevated whatever that is to some position in life, and you now, in essence, worship uh, those individuals or those items. So it doesn't mean that you're bowing down and humming or singing or... Uh, that's a form of worship or a style, but worship means you've placed a value into it. So all of us, just so we know before we move forward, so we're all on the same playing field. All of us have worshipped something or someone other than God before. We have. We've placed value into something that we considered more value valuable than the time or relationship we have with the Lord. So keep that in mind. Uh, notice what he says. Who should we worship? Notice what it says in verse 1 of Psalm 150. Praise ye the what? Who's, who's the person we're speaking about? The Lord. we got to identify. If we're going to place value into someone, the Bible says in Psalm 150 to place that value in the Lord. So who are we going to worship? So the word is hallelujah. And we would say, hallelujah to the Lord. Praise be to God. Praise God. So we've got to establish who He is. So we're going to worship the Lord according to Psalm 150. But if you're uh, like me, maybe you're a thinker and you're going through this and you're like, you're just not going to tell me to do something and I'm going to do it. So i got to know who is God. Like, who is God that I would go out and worship uh, a God that I've never seen, that I've never audibly heard, and that I just don't understand because if there is a God, A, B, and C wouldn't happen. So who is God? And God is an amazing uh, spirit because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of John that God is a spirit. So if you're going to worship God, you've got to worship Him as a spirit. You've got to worship Him in spirit. So in order for us to truly worship, we've got to know who God is. He's a spirit. God's more than a spirit. He's He's a God of love, and we talk about that all the time. God loves you. What, what was the song today? What did Olivia sing today? You know, remember? Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. Now, how did she know that according to the song? The Bible tells me so. The Bible's an amazing book, collection. So we got to know who God is. God is love. God's also a God of wrath. The Bible says... Uh, that if we're not saved, then we abide under His wrath. That's who God is. So my job is to inform you of who God is so that we're able to worship Him. And we know that God is love. We're free to worship Him because of all the great things that happen. But when we know that God is wrath, we worship Him because we fear Him. We respect His authority. God is also, according to the Bible, He's a jealous God. Have you ever been jealous in your life? The Lord, have I been jealous? We've all been jealous, right? Yeah. Yeah. We've been jealous. Um, I'm almost at the point in life, I'm like, probably jealous over like food and stuff. Like, who got better food? And who got. Because when you get to a point in relationships that you know that you love each other, you can sit and like always relax, relax. This is a bond that's not going to be separated. So you can relax, and but if you're not relaxed, you become jealous. Now, by the way, that's an unhealthy jealousy. God, in its in His purest form, is jealous of you. In the purest form, that's what the Bible says. He's jealous of you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants undivided attention. Isn't that what you want in a relationship? You want undivided attention at some point. So at some sometimes you've understood what jealousy is. But God, if we're going to worship Him as a jealous God. He's a God of power. He's a God of strength. He, he is Jesus in the flesh, according to the book of John. The Bible says that He's an all-knowing God. He knows everything. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that all the stars He has uh, numbered, 
And he's also named them. He has a name for every star. So if we're worshiping, if Sunday saints are worshiping on a daily uh, thing, we'll walk out and we'll see stars and we will begin to identify that those stars are not just numbered, they're named. They're named. Can we tell you how important that is? Like I asked a young girl today, uh, she had an Awana bag. Think about this. You, you attend Awana? Where do you attend Awana? How long have you been in Awana? And Andrew said she's been here two years. <laughs> so I think Elaine asked somebody's name and said, you might want to talk to the pastor. He might know what's going on. And the pastor should know their name. Been here two years. And God knows every star by name. You ever see someone and it's like, oh man, i got to speak to them, but I don't know their name. So what do you usually call them? What do guys do? Hey, hey buddy. buddy. What's up, buddy? I got that right with Buddy Johnson, by the way. I was like, hey, buddy, what's up? His name's Buddy. It's like, how do you know me? Hey, bud, what's up? Hey, man, what's going on? How's things been, man? God knows every star by name. Isn't that amazing? It causes you to want to worship, to think, man, you're telling me that God's Word, with his, which has withstood the test of time, says that God has every star numbered and named. Yes, as a matter of fact, the Bible goes further. Every hair on your head is numbered. All that no shave November, God knows every hair on our face. Isn't it amazing to stop and think that God knows that information? Don't you you know what's amazing about uh, fall? One of the great things about fall, if you go to the fall festival at school or uh, you know, maybe your church and they always have the jar of candy. And you got to do what with the jar of candy? Yes, yes. yes the amount. It's such a challenge. Everybody's like, so I got online to figure out how to do this and win. <laughs> <laughs> True. And uh, the last time I did it, I think Cindy Fustad had been moving the line. I think it was Cindy. But anyway, you take, well, I'll go ahead and tell you, you take all the guesses and you add them up and you get divide it and get the average and then you put that in because everybody's going to guess so far above and below naturally that you can get close to the average. So I'm standing there adding all these up. And everybody's like, could you hurry up, man? <laughs> I just want to know the number, right? But God instantly knows about us. It causes us to want to worship. So worship's not waiting to get to a place to become some feeling or some motivation it's a way of life. That's what worship is. So he's an all-knowing God. He's an all-powerful God. That's what the Bible tells us in Matthew and Luke. He's a God that's present everywhere at once. Um, he's omnipresent. So the Bible says that we should praise the Lord. But where do we praise Him? Notice what verse 1 says. So we've identified who but where. It says, praise ye the Lord. Praise God where? In His sanctuary. So where's the sanctuary? What's well, 1504 Princeton Avenue? And you come to the sanctuary and you praise the Lord. Well, by the way, um, when I was in the sanctuary of Brush Fork Baptist Church when I was a child, and I've shared this with you before, and I did something inappropriate in the sanctuary, my, my dad would make a note of that, by the way. <laughs> and, <laughs> in many ways, many forms of notes. And uh, he was great. He was always great at being calm. He's like, when I get you home, this is what I'm going to do. Amen. <laughs> really calm. Like, how do you do that? So I would come home, and he'd calmly <coughs> say, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm like, whoa. This is a serious day. So the sanctuary has become a, a holy place for many Christians. Our sanctuary, we would say, oh, it's holy. Don't do this. Don't do that. And we we probably in reality would do that out of reverence to the Lord. But not because the hardwood floor is holy or the blue is holy. It's because we feel like we're in His sanctuary. But where is God's sanctuary? God's sanctuary just by God's Word is everywhere. Now notice what He said. Praise God in His sanctuary. Um, praise Him in the firmament of His power. That's His mighty, the expanse. That's how great God is. So where do we worship Him? We worship Him here and we worship Him there. God is everywhere. Everywhere you go is God's sanctuary. Whether you are worshiping God or not, you are always in His sanctuary. I want you to hear that again. Regardless of whether you're worshiping or not, you are always in God's sanctuary. So when should you be on your best behavior? 
<laughs> well, all the time. Because you're always in the sanctuary. It's not just when you show up here and your kid has the hat on and you try to knock it off. That's what my dad would. It's everywhere, right? So I'm not saying don't wear a ball cap. I'm saying always be worshiping. Where do we worship? We worship in His sanctuary, His mighty expanse, His power that He has. We've identified that. So notice what He says. Praise the Lord or hallelujah to God here on earth and in heaven. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Right? I say, we say that often. I say it. Hallelujah to God. Uh, the idea of binoculars. Anybody ever owned a set of binoculars or used them? Why do you use binoculars? You take a, an object that's further away and you try to draw it closer. This is what worship is. It's, it's that binocular effect. And you're taking its effort on your part and you're magnifying the Lord. You ever, you ever hear what we say, bringing praise, honor, and glory to God? That's the binocular effect. You're going you're gonna to magnify the Lord. You're going to make Him much larger than anything else around you. This is what the binocular does. If I put, put on those and I would look out and everything around me I would not be able to focus on because it's drawn into one object, one person, one event, whatever that is. This is the binocular effect. Hallelujah to God here on earth and in heaven. It magnifies this object. This, the book of Psalm 34 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Help me finish this little statement or phrase. Mirror, mirror on the wall. <laughs> What's the idea of a mirror? A mirror, it shows your image. It magnifies you or the person in the mirror. In our society, we have a mirror, mirror on the wall mentality. It's all about me. And it's not about God. Now, I'm not speaking as a whole because I want to try to eliminate those phrases uh, in my preaching and in my life. The absolutes. We've got to be careful with our absolutes. But I'm wondering out loud as a whole, do we have the mirror, mirror on the wall mentality or do we really have the binocular effect where we're looking at God and magnifying who He is or is it all about us? And I want you to hear this. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn here if you want. If not, but Philippians 4.13, I would say you're familiar with this. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things, what? Through Christ which strengtheneth me. And we've used that verse for this. Got a big ball game today. It won't hit me a home run. I can do all things through Christ. Now, I hope you did hit a home run, right? I believe the Lord would be happy if you did or if you didn't. <laughs> um, well, I've got a, got a job interview. Just want you to know, Mr. Job Interviewer, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. And all that's great. Let me tell you what he wants. He wants you to be able to, in life's storms and troubles and trials and tribulations and the ups and downs of relationships and finances and children and stress, that you're able to accomplish kingdom matters because of Jesus Christ who gives you strength. But we have mirror mirrored on the wall the mentality of God's Word to say, what can I accomplish through the magical formula of Philippians 4.13? It's not a magic formula. Not a statement that says, because I can repeat this X amount of times, many things will be accomplished in my life. And praise be to God, or hallelujah to God, if it does, what if it doesn't? Then we look at God's Word as in error to say, you know, Philippians 4.13, it just doesn't work. This isn't a working formula. It's God's Word that says, you will be challenged in your life. You haven't been challenged, you will. And when you are challenged, Jesus Christ, who you are worshiping daily, will give you the strength to overcome what you're challenged with. As a matter of fact, he goes on a little further in verse 19 of Philippians 4, and he says, because of all those other wants and desires which are still okay, as long as they're not magnified above the Lord, all that's okay. Like all the things we want's okay, as long as it's in perspective, it's in uh, relation to the Lord, he says, but my God shall do what? Supply all your need, which is my need, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So God said, I've got all the rest figured out. I really just want you building the kingdom. 
So we got to understand when we worship what that means. So I'm back in Psalm 150. I encourage you to turn back there as we begin to close. Why should we worship? Notice these thoughts. Praise Him or hallelujah. Why should we worship the Lord? He said, all right, Chad, you've identified who He is, but why in the world would I worship a God when all these bad things happen? Well, here's some reasons why you would worship God. One, according to verse 2, is because of His mighty acts. That's what God has done for you. You would say, He's done nothing for me. All right? We'll move right along then. Let's say in your mind and in your life you're going to say He hasn't, but how do you get around verse 2 where it says, Worship Him because of His excellent greatness. That's who He is. There's no denying who God is. He's the great I Am, according to the Old Testament. He's, he's Creator of the world, and even more, He's Redeemer of mankind. Those are mighty acts, and if we can't get past what we think He's done, if we just get to His excellent greatness, it will always take us back to what He's done. He's a great and awesome God. The Bible says He's a terrible God, which by translation means awesome. He's an awesome God. There's reasons to worship because He's all-knowing, He's everywhere, He has unlimited power. But how do we worship? Notice verses 3 through 5, and you can read those, but how does He worship? He goes through all these instruments, which I said last night to a young lady that says she played the uh, clarinet. I wish the church, I wish churches had clarinets and saxophones. I really do. Why would you do that so you can worship? That's why I'd like that. Aren't you a saxophone? Is you a saxophone player? No. Trumpet. Trumpet. I wish we had trumpet players in the church. <laughs> um, just a whole group of people. That, what'd you play? Did you play something? Okay. I was drum line. Drum line? I wish we had a drum line. In the <laughs> Start at those double doors and come down this aisle. Did you play something? Anybody play else play anything? anything? <laughs> what'd you play? What was it? Tambourine? Oh, she carried them all. Come down. Get you a little portable, a little piano, a little tambourine, and a guitar. And one of those harmonicas that go right through. That would be nice. You know what my point is? You would be free to worship. Where did God ever say, bottle up all your talents and all your excitement and all of your interest? And come out to a building and just do nothing. He didn't say that, did he? He said, worship. Worship. Sunday saints know that. They worship. So how do you worship? It goes through all these things. But I really like the, the part here at the bottom. In verse 5 it says, Praise Him upon the symbols. But I left a, a word out. What was the word? Oh, say it again. Turn to your neighbor and say loud. Loud. Church ought to be loud. I mean, ought to be loud. Now, some of us say, well, we can be, I really don't want the symbols. And I probably don't either, just to be honest with you. Yeah, symbols. Oh, well, they kind of get me, you know. I don't want the symbols. But I'd take it if you want to worship. I'm a symbol guy, you know, but it's fine. we do symbols. Praise Him upon the high sounding symbols, which is a whole different pitch. But uh, here, here's the way I would sum up 3 through 5. And you, some of you have this already because we've gone through this passage many, many times. It's loud and proud. Loud and proud. I want us all on the same page with worship. Loud and proud. As a matter of fact, uh, this should be one word. We've identified this before as intensity. You should worship with intensity. By definition, that's great concentration, power, or force. So who should worship Him according to the last verse? Who should worship the Lord? If we've identified who He is and where He is and how we're going to do that, who should be doing the worshiping? Notice verse 6. Who should worship the Lord? Everything that hath what? Breath. breath. If breath. you can breathe according to God's Word, you should be worshiping. Amen. And he didn't identify a place and a time. Here they didn't identify a place and a time. He didn't ask us to go out and define what worship is and what you should and shouldn't do. He said, worship everything that has breath, 
Again, praise is hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. All of God's living creatures, hallelujah to the Lord. A traveler called his companion's attention to a firm's peculiar name. It was Head and Heart. The companion remarked, Poor Heart has died and left Head alone. This often occurs in Christian life, in a Christian worship, and in a Christian service. It's all head and no heart. We are thinking our way through Christianity when Jesus came to transform the heart. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Or maybe the adults sing, Open the eyes of what? My heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart so that I can see you and worship you. God alone is worthy of your worship. Whatever else you worship or are worshiping now, whether it's ambition, money, appetite, beauty, affections, friends, all of them together, one by one, will set and disappear in your life. But God remains constant. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Give Him first place in your life. Give Him your devotion, your strength, and your love. Sunday saints understand the importance of daily worship. Every head